everyone. This video is for those who didn't have the chance to attend the orientation session uh, for the clinical or the upcoming clinical course. In this session, I'll focus on two sections actually, or this session is divided into two sections. The first section uh, is regarding the orientation and how can we recover the curriculum and I'll answer uh, all the questions regarding uh, how can we cover the curriculum and how can we study how can we uh, pass from uh, the first time or how can we increase our chances for passing from the first time either in the clinical ICO exam or uh, the clinical FRCS uh, Glasgow second part exam uh, or uh, the fellowship of the European board exam, uh, European board exam. okay? Uh, in the second section of um, uh, this session, I'll uh, have an introduction to the first branch that I uh, uh, want to start with, which is neuroophthalmology. And the, the uh, second section will talk about, or I'll talk about uh, the neuroophthalmic examination in this section. First of all, regarding the orientation, as you see, I do have my own sources, or I do have my own notes. These notes are collected um, mainly from American Academy of Ophthalmology, BCSC uh, series, and uh, American Academy of Ophthalmology, is considered here the main dish of this course. With some additions from Kamsky, which is very important book actually, uh, some topics are written um, uh, better in Kamsky, so I depended on Kamsky also. The photos are excellent in Kamsky. That's why I depended on American Academy and Kamsky together with some information from Oxford Handbook. And this is the, the preferred book for any British exam, either the FRCS exam or FRC of London, um, uh, Oxford Handbook is uh, the main source actually of reading. Uh, for those who are sitting for uh, the FRCS exam or FRC of the exam, I do have uh, revision sessions uh, for, or there will be revision sessions for uh, Oxford Handbook uh, in which I'll, I'll uh, talk about some differences uh, or, or some information which are not mentioned before in, in, uh, in the course. Uh, but these videos or these sessions will be recorded, it won't be live. Okay, so here, these are the sources for these notes, and I think they are the most reliable sources uh, on which most of the candidates can depend. Uh, regarding the questions, I believe in solving questions together with studying, not uh, only solving the questions and not only studying, but actually after each topic I have to solve, uh, the relevant questions regarding this topic. For example, after papilledema, here you will find that there are questions after optic neuritis and ischemic optic neuropathies. Look at this here, after papilledema, after we finish papilledema, actually, we do have questions. These questions are uh, collected mainly from IDOC's website, together with also questions and Kenneth Wright and Massachusetts, all of the relevant and uh, most famous uh, books that we can depend on uh, preparation for um, yeah, these exams, either clinical ICO exam or um, uh, clinical or second part FRCS Glasgow exam or even a FIBU or European board exam. Okay. Um, uh, you will find these questions. Uh, some selected questions, you will find the explanation in which uh, the, the, the question was somehow tricky or the uh, uh, the information in the previous notes are not obvious regarding this part, or there is information which can be added from um, this, in this explanation. So I selected some uh, questions uh, and I kept their uh, explanation from IDOX and so on. Uh, why do I prefer American Academy? Actually, this is not the most reliable book and actually it is very helpful in the practical life. Um, I can uh, tell you uh, honestly that you can depend on American Academy. You can read American Academy and then go to your clinic and take or make decisions. Um, uh, this is uh, for me, uh, actually, this was uh, very helpful for me. And I, um, I'm keen on reading um, um, every version every year from American Academy. This series actually is uh, very interesting for me. And also uh, this was very helpful for me uh, in passing these questions. And why do I prefer iDocs as the main source of um, selecting and taking MCQs? And also I recommend that you uh, do have this source uh, and you, you solve this source because uh, actually iDocs uh, depended on 
the information uh, provided previously by the uh, most relevant books like uh, Kenneth Wright and Massachusetts with some modifications. So you won't miss anything if you solve just uh, iBooks. Also, the questions are repeated. So here it is dependent on the main sources like uh, Kenneth Wright and Massachusetts, which are MCQ books or MCQs, MCQs books. Uh, together with repeating the same information more and more, so you have you 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 are memorizing while reading the explanations of iDocs, and the third uh, um, and the third purpose or the third cause, um, uh, the third benefit actually is uh, for those who are sitting for uh, the second FRCS Glasgow exam because the mode of questions. Uh, is exactly the same like that of FRCS Glasgow exam with some of the, the previous um, or some of the previous questions from the previous FRCS Glasgow exams. Um, you, you have five choices like that in FRCS Glasgow. Also, you have long questions or cases uh, like that of uh, you know, the FRCS exam. Uh, also, candidates who are sitting for FIBO, iDocs uh, remains um, or iDocs website remains a good source for solving MCQs. Okay, uh, this is uh, how can we will uh, solve the MCQs while we are studying and so on. Also, there is something which is uh, very good. I'll I'll share. Uh, it's fine here. Look at this. Uh, after each session, I'll share the, the schedule at first. Okay, look at the schedule here. For example, you will find that we do have sessions. The first session will be orientation together with uh, neuroophthalmic examination. Uh, uh, and in this session, I'll, I'll try to cover uh, this, uh, this part. I'll try to cover briefly this part. Uh, actually, this is a recorded one for those who didn't attend the live one. Okay. Um, uh, on Saturday or the sec second session will be regarding papilledema and optic neuritis and so on. Uh, and you will find the, the whole schedule for June uh, month, uh, which will cover three branches. Uh, the first one is neuroophthalmology, the second one is uh, strabismus, and the third one is uveitis. Actually, this is considered one third of the curriculum. Okay. Um, after that, for each session, uh, you will find. I'll share another file, look at this. You will find a complementary file or a file for solving the previous papers, but this file is structured. So regarding session two, session two was regarding, as you remember, papilledema and optic neuritis. So these questions are questions about papilledema and optic neuritis from the previous ICO exams. Actually, this is helpful, not only for candidates who are sitting for clinical ICO, but also for candidates who are sitting for second FRCS Glasgow exam and also for uh, candidates who are sitting for FIBO exam because the information provided in the MCQ banks or MCQ, uh, so ICO banks, sorry, or IC, ICO uh, previous exams um, are extremely helpful and um, you can uh, fix and you can, um, you, you can um, uh, remind yourself with your information from solving these uh, sources or these banks. Um, but I, I saw that uh, there is an uh, important uh, issue regarding uh, rearrangement of these questions in order to have uh, for each session um, uh, the questions or the re relevant questions for each session. You will find uh, regarding session two questions regarding session three, which is about um, uh, ischemic optic neuropathy, infiltrative and compressive optic neuropathies. And in, in session, for example, in session four, which is regarding hereditary and optic this hereditary, op, hereditary optic neuropathies and optic uh, disc anomalies or congenital optic disc anomalies and so on. Uh, regarding session five, which is regarding chiasma or um, uh, retrochiasma lesions or uh, in general visual pathway lesions and so on. Uh, and so on, you, you, uh, you understand the idea. Uh, these are questions from the pre previous ISO exams, but these questions uh, are structured according to our schedule um, of uh, sessions. Uh, this is how can we will study, how can we solve the previous ICO exams. Also, I want to remind you that we do have um, about 10 sessions uh, in which we will solve the previous ICO exams. Also, uh, for candidates who are sitting for FIBO, we will solve uh, there is uh, an important website 
which is um, relevant to the questions of people, we will solve this website together with covering the curriculum. And uh, I'm telling you that covering the curriculum will be very sufficient for passing this exam, even without solving this website, but this will be solved instead of uh, solving the previous ISO exams. Okay. Uh, this is uh, regarding the curriculum and how can we will cover or how we will, we can cover uh, all of these topics. Uh, we do have uh, 70 sessions uh, regarding the whole clinical course curriculum. Um, for candidates who are sitting for uh, European Board Examination or FIBO, they uh, do have also uh, 20 recorded sessions regarding the visual sciences like optics and anatomy and microbiology and pharmacology, which are relevant and important for uh, passing this exam. I know that uh, their questions are not that many, but for candidates who, who uh, want to um, know everything or study everything regarding the curriculum, this will be also available. Okay. Um, I'll start. Uh, also, I want to tell you that there is something uh, important uh, for me, which is the PowerPoint. Actually, you will find uh, or you will have this PDF. You can print this out in order to uh, follow me while I'm talking, but uh, I'll uh, talk from the PowerPoint. Look at this examination. Or evaluation. Actually, this is the first uh, topic or the first uh, 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 the first lecture um, or the introduction you know, for the neuroophthalmic diseases. Uh, you will find the same information or the same notes uh, in your PDF, but here uh, the PowerPoint will give me uh, more freedom to add some comments and also to add more pictures, more memes, more screenshots from movies and so on. Uh, so I can I can feel free <laughs> to add everything I want, um, every relevant uh, thing uh, in which or or uh, or which uh, cannot be added easily to the PDF. Okay. Uh, this uh, is um, regarding the first section of this session. The second part regarding, uh, I'll talk briefly about neuroophthalmic examination. Um, regarding neuroophthalmic ex examination, I do have two issues or two main parts, the history part and the examination part. Okay, in the history part, I have to answer three questions. The first one is the lesion unilateral or bilateral or unilaterality versus bilaterality. Is it unilateral or bilateral? This is the first question. The second one is regarding uh, the onset. Is the onset uh, sudden? Is the onset uh, gradual? Is the onset acute? And so on. The third question is regarding the, the associated symptoms. Uh, do you have associated symptoms? Uh, are these associated symptoms uh, more uh, specific for some diseases and so on? And we will give examples about all of these. This is regarding the history part. The second part, we will talk about examination. And here you do have the 3F. Actually, in this mnemonic of 3F, I took this, uh, I took this mnemonic from Dr. Hussein Siwila, uh, an Egyptian professor. Here I do have uh, the first F, which is uh, visual functions. Regarding visual functions, I do have visual acuity, colored vision, and also I do have pupil reactivity. And the second if uh, is fundus examination. The third if is visual field. Actually, uh, this is the evaluation of any neuroophthalmic disease, but we don't know whether the disease is neuroophthalmic or not. So this, is, this can be the evaluation of any case of decreased vision of uh, uh, unknown cause. Okay, so uh, actually if the decreased vision is uh, uh, due to cataract or due to uh, refractive error, this is not that important uh, to, to have uh, this evaluation, but actually any case of decreased vision due to uh, either retinal cause or neurophthalmic cause, you do have to do um, you know, all of, uh, uh, you have to answer these questions regarding the history and you have to do um, uh, the three F regarding examination. Uh, let's start with the history or the questions of the history. Regarding uh, the history, you have to answer unilateral uh, lesion or bilateral lesion, whether the condition is unilateral or bilateral. For example, if you do have uh, the first eye uh, has optic nerve like that, 
And here you do have decussition in the optic chiasm. Look at, look at this. You do have decussition in the optic chiasm. So before the optic chiasm, you do have unilateral lesion. So any unilateral lesion will be confined to uh, the area before the optic chiasm. And here look from uh, the optic chiasm and beyond, if you do have any lesion, it will give you bilateral visual field defects. So unilateral visual field defects or unilateral lesions uh, are related to uh, the area which is um, the area of the optic nerve or the visual pathway, which is before the optic chiasm, okay? And bilateral lesions are from the optic chiasm and beyond. Okay. And this is the first question. The second question, which is the onset, this may give me a hint or a clue regarding um, uh, the etiology, okay? Uh, if you do have sudden onset, this may be due to um, ischemic or vascular or traumatic causes. If you do have acute or subacute uh, onset, uh, like from hours to days, this may be inflammatory. And if you do have uh, chronic or gradual onset. Uh, this may be due to space occupying lesion or any compressive lesion or growing tumor and so on. What about the third, third question, which is regarding the associated symptoms? Uh, there are some manifestations uh, which may be specific and pathognomonic for some diseases like joke medications and also um, and, uh, and also facial, uh, uh, facial tenderness or, or uh, uh, temporal area tenderness, which, is, uh, which may be pathognomonic or may be uh, characteristic for giant cell arthritis. Actually, this, uh, uh, to diagnose this, uh, may be side-threatening and also may be life-threatening, not only side-threatening. So in the history, you have to answer these questions. The first one is laterality, whether it is unilateral or bilateral. The second is time course, and the third is associated symptoms. And here you will find uh, the relevant information that I told you. Here, look at this. Vascular is very rapid, traumatic. Inflammatory is uh, uh, acute. And here, the space occupying or degenerative may be uh, of gradual onset and so on. Look at the elevated intracranial pressure. It has two modes. Actually, you do have rarely onset papilledema manifestations, and also you do have chronic papilledema manifestations. And this will be mentioned in the second session. Um, this is regarding joint cell arthritis. As, as I told you, actually this comment is not present in the PDF and as I told you, I do have here some freedom to, um, to add uh, more comments and to add more photos and so on. Okay, look at this. Uh, the ophthalmologist may be the first one to diagnose life threatening condition like that of uh, joint cell arthritis. Okay, bilateral and unilateral. This is also a photo here. The lesion is unilateral because it is confined. Actually, it is superior altitudinal defect, which is combined to one eye. But here, look at this. This is bilateral lesion. You do have right monomacinalokia in this uh, visual field photo and so on. Regarding examination, as I told you, you do have three Fs. The first F is the visual functions. And here in the visual functions, you have to comment on visual acuity. You have to test the visual acuity, color vision. And the third one is pupillary activity. Okay. Uh, we will talk about the visual functions right now. Regarding the visual acuity, it must be, um, uh, it must be expressed uh, either in the distant form or um, uh, this is especially in, in cases with very poor vision. You have to make the patient closer. For example, if the patient is seeing 660, there is no problem. But if the patient doesn't see 660, if the patient doesn't see the largest uh, uh, optotype or the largest litter in um, uh, snail and chart, how can you, you deal with this patient? Actually, uh, in American Academy, they, they don't recommend the counting finger, uh, but instead uh, you can ask the patient to come closer like uh, five on five meters or at a distance of five meters in order to have or to obtain 560 or 460 and so on. Actually, this is more reproducible uh, than uh, the method of counting finger. Actually, this can be, uh, I can rely uh, on, on this and also I can do something like that uh, in uh, another clinic or by another doctor and so on. That's why it is more reproducible 
and in American Academy, they recommend this. Actually, this is not important for the exam, but as I told you, American Academy will give you hints of how can you deal with the patient from A to Z. Also regarding color vision, actually color vision will be affected in cases of uh, optic neuropathies, in almost in all cases of optic neuropathies. But here, uh, regarding color vision, I want to um, uh, raise your attention about something which is very important. Color vision will be severely affected in cases of optic uh, neuritis or inflammatory optic neuropathy. In cases of optic neuritis, actually you have affection or severe affection of color vision, which is not proportion or which is out of proportion to the decrease in visual acuity. So the visual acuity is decreased, but the color vision will be more severely decreased, okay? Unlike that of the ischemic optic neuropathy, actually they will be uh, decreased, but in proportion to each other. Uh, the second issue regarding uh, the color vision is how can we test the color vision? Actually do have the Ishahara test, but Ishahara test is not uh, that, uh, sensitive, you may have a uh, good uh, Ishahara test, you may, you may succeed in, in passing uh, Ishahara test, but actually you do still have uh, a color vision defect, especially in blue, uh, yellow um, uh, color vision defects. And uh, for, for, for these cases, you do have uh, uh, more than one test like uh, Franz Worth's uh, Monsel 100U test or uh, Franz Worth's a 15 or D15 hue uh, test. Actually, they are extremely important without details or without uh, um, uh, talking uh, or, or, or uh, uh, without more details regarding them. Uh, they are they may be used in, in cases of or they are preferred to be used uh, uh, together with Ishahara test in cases of optic neurites. So you don't uh, just depend on Ishahara test. Also, uh, there is a test um, which is called Hardy uh, Rand Rittler. Actually, this is the same like that of Ishara test, but it is more sensitive. You can find uh, uh, the photos or the plates or the cards on Google. You can Google them. Uh, actually, they are the same or almost the same like that of Ishara test, but they are sensitive also for uh, blue, yellow color defects. Uh, regarding this one, I saw this one before, Franz Force Panel D15 uh, in test. Um, I, I saw uh, this and actually uh, we do, uh, or we did have uh, patients who uh, tested uh, uh, positive or tested, not positive, who tested um, uh, like normal in Ishahara test and they are, they are not normal regarding this one. So this, is, this one is more sensitive to uh, color vision defects in cases of uh, optic neuropathies. The third part, which is regarding relative afferent pupillary defect, um, I want to tell you that without details, we can test for relative afferent pupillary defect using swinging flashlight. Because I know that, uh, or I, I think that relative afferent pupillary defect is very easy to be, um, uh, uh, all of you, uh, I guess uh, no no will about relative apparent pupillary defect. So uh, I won't waste your time telling you about the details uh, about this one. But here, what what do you mean by the word relative? Relative means in comparison to the other eye. So if you do have bilateral lesion, you may not find uh, relative apparent pupillary defect because in comparison to each other, they are all defected and they are the same. Both are defected, both are the same. But if you do have uh, bilateral lesion, but asymmetrical, uh, you will have relative apparent pupillary defect in the, the severely affected eye. So it is more evident in unilateral uh, diseases or in, in uh, uh, severely affected eye in bilateral diseases or bilateral and asymmetrical diseases. But if you do have bilateral and uh, symmetrical disease, you won't have relative apparent pupillary defect. Uh, this is regarding the relative apparent pupillary defect. You may find uh, more details, um, more details regarding uh, the neutral density filter in cases of fine relative apparent pupillary defects and uh, uh, what is the, um, uh, the pupillary activity regarding uh, optic tract lesions and so on. All of this will be mentioned again while we are talking about uh, visual pathway defects. Okay, look at this one. This may be misleading actually because uh, this is related to pharmacologic, pharmacological dilatations 
uh, rather than the relative African superiority tax. So don't, don't be confused about this. Also, uh, I want to tell you that relative African superiority defect doesn't cause anisocory, and this will be mentioned in uh, the questions. Uh, this is related to the, nat the nature of um, uh, the nature of um, uh, the visual pathway, which has afferent and efferent. If you do have afferent defect, this won't result in uh, anisocoria, and if you do have an efferent defect, this will result for sure uh, will will result uh, in uh, anisocoria. Okay. Uh, this was regarding the first if, the visual functions. So in visual functions, you have to do visual acuity, color vision testing, and also pupillary activity. The second if, which is related to the fundus examination, also without details, you have to look for, um, you have to look for uh, optic disc pallor, optic nerve head edema, or optic disc edema. Uh, and also you have to know the, um, signs of true optic disc edema in order to differentiate uh, between the true and the pseudo uh, swelling of the optic nerve head. And this will be mentioned in greater detail in the uh, next session or in the second session regarding papilledema. And uh, the third uh, one to be known, which is associated retinal manifestations. So um, uh, examination of uh, the optic disc in an pupil or through an pupil is not that sufficient because you have to look or to have a good look um, uh, on the retina because this may give you a hint. For example, if you do have uh, diabetic retinopathy, this may give you a hint about um, uh, the, the optic nerve lesion or optic neuropathy as being diabetic papillopathy and so on. Uh, also, you may have a double pathology like in cases of retinitis pigmentosa, it is uh, almost associated or in, in, in some percentage of these cases may be associated with optic disc bruising or consecutive optic atrophy and so on. So you, you may, you, you have to look for optic disc pallor, you have to look for optic nerve head edema and differentiate between the characters of true edema in order to um, distinguish uh, the optic, uh, the true optic disc edema or true uh, optic nerve head edema uh, from uh, pseudo swelling or pseudo edema. Also, you have to look for associated retinal manifestations or retinal signs. Uh, the third F is regarding um, the uh, visual field analysis or visual field perimetry. Um, for a neuroophthalmic disease, not for glaucoma, actually, but for neuroophthalmic disease, you may do the confrontation method. It is not that sensitive and also it is not specific at all, but here, um, you do have more than one method of the confrontation method, which may be important for uh, neurologists and also for uh, neuroophthalmic diseases. Uh, the first uh, method, uh, the patient can sit at a distance of one meter and uh, he uh, will be looking at my nose uh, or looking at the observer's nose and uh, he will uh, 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 try to describe the examiner's face. So the first one or the first method is describing the examiner's face. The second one, which is more famous, uh, is um, a counting finger in the four quadrants. Okay. Uh, the third one um, will be regarding um, uh, will be regarding um, yeah, the color perception actually because uh, the visual field effect in some diseases like bitemporal hemianopia and pituitary adenoma may be in the form of uh, color desaturation or color vision defect. So you do have the, the retin of the cycloplegic eye drop. Um, this cover of the cycloplegic eye drop uh, is demonstrated in the four quadrants until it is seen as being red or it is moved from the non-seeing area to the seeing area until it is seen as being red, not only um, a cover or uh, uh, an eye drop pin. Uh, it must be seen as uh, red, and this is uh, helpful in, in some diseases like uh, uh, the example that I told you about by temporal hemianopia or color desaturation or red color desaturation in, in cases of by temporal hemianopia uh, with regard to pituitary adenoma and so on. The fourth one, which is simultaneous, um, uh, simultaneous stimulation or simultaneous uh, uh, perception from the nasal field and also the temporal field of the same eye. So regarding the right eye, for example, 
uh, I'll have to put my finger or the red pin of uh, the um, cycloplegic eye drop um, in either the nasal or in uh, simultaneously in the nasal, one finger in the nasal field for the patient and in the temporal field for, for the patient. Um, actually, there are some diseases in which you won't feel that you do have a visual field effect uh, 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 until you do have a comparison or simultaneous perception like that. So I can see the finger for the, uh, 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 I, I consider myself as a patient. I, I'll see uh, the finger in the nasal field and the same finger I can see also in the temporal field. But if I do have two fingers, one simultaneously, one in the nasal field and the other for, uh, in the temporal field, for example, I neglect someone. This is called contralateral neglect, or this is called neglect, which is which may be specific for um, the non-dominant uh, parietal loop lesion and so on. This will be mentioned in greater detail uh, in visual pathway lesions. And also there is a sign, uh, this sign is called extinction, which is the inability to see, uh, 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 inability to see uh, just, just or only in cases of simultaneous perception or simultaneous comparison, okay? This is called extension. All of, all of these information are written like that. Look at uh, the second F, which is regarding the fundus examination. Here, there is optic disc color in this photo. This photo is uh, um, considered normal. And here, uh, there are visual field effects. Actually, this will be demonstrated more if you use um, the um, uh, red free um, filter. Uh, also, uh, if you see this, this is uh, these are the characteristics, or you will find the characteristics of uh, true optic disc edema, and this is a case of bilateral papillary edema in both eyes. This will be mentioned in uh, the next one. This is regarding the confrontation testing, and uh, the last issue I told you is something called extinction. Uh, regarding the visual field, uh, uh, what about uh, confrontation method? Actually, we don't do confrontation methods or confrontation uh, method uh, regularly in our clinics uh, because it is it, it has low specificity and also the sensitivity is not that high. Okay, regarding Amstar grid, uh, it is important for demonstrating central scotomas or central visual field effects. Actually, this is not that important in um, uh, optic nerve diseases, but it is very important in cases of uh, age related macular degenerations or any macular lesion with affection of the central visual field. What are the differences between the, these seven cards? Actually, this is the main one, uh, which is vertical and horizontal lines, and the patient is asked to fix it on or to, to, to fix his eyes on, on this uh, central white dot. Okay. Um, it is used for screening if the patient sees uh, any abnormality. He will seek medical advice and he will be uh, tested. Actually, this is important, as I told you, in cases of age-related macular degeneration. If the patient has a central scotoma, like in this example, here you do have diagonal lines. These lines are helpful in order to make the patient expect that this part is um, uh, the intersection of uh, these diagonal lines and this is uh, the expected part for fixation. This is in cases of central scotoma because in central scotoma, the patient won't uh, find the point of fixation. Uh, as I told you, the visual field defect may be in the form of color vision defect. So chart three is very important in demonstrating this one. Uh, chart number four is important uh, to differentiate between central scotoma or uh, positive scotoma in which you will find a black area of absent uh, uh, dots as you see like that. And also metamorphopsia. Metamorphopsia uh, will be the same. So in metamorphopsia, the random dots will, will, will remain random dots. But positive scotoma will be, uh, or, or any scotoma or any central scotoma, this will be uh, a defect here like that. So if you do have normal chart four, this is metamorphopsia. Actually, it is not uh, central scotoma. Chart number five is, uh, uh, important it is just horizontal lines, uh, which is important for um, determining the ability uh, to read. Chart number six is refinement of chart number five, because here you do have uh, horizontal lines with uh, very small intervals or very small distances between them. 
and also chart number seven is uh, the same idea about chart number one. It is refinement of chart number one. These are the more the most or or the the, the old famous or the old seven cards of the Amstrad grid testing, which is as I told you specific for um, uh, testing the central visual field effect because it is uh, related. Uh, or because it is uh, hold at a distance of from 30 to uh, 40 centimeters. Regarding perimetry, it is actually the gold standard, uh, but which, which one, kinetic or static? Actually, kinetic may be more helpful in some uh, rare neuroophthalmic diseases, which may be just related to the far periphery. But automated uh, static uh, 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 perimetry is like Humphrey or Octopus. This will be the gold standard one. Uh, because actually all of its data will be reproducible. We can use uh, this data in statistical analysis. Uh, the data uh, are stored and also you don't depend on the clinician uh, or the technician uh, skills. Uh, uh, all of these uh, also you can, you can uh, guide the progression or you can uh, detect the progression of these cases and all of these details will be mentioned again in, in uh, glaucoma. Uh, the difference between the technique of kinetic and static perimetry uh, was mentioned. Actually, I mentioned this and I always mention this in, in, uh, um, yeah, in, in uh, the first uh, part, which is uh, the visual sciences uh, part, uh, physiology part specifically, also uh, for candidates who are sitting for um, uh, first, if RC off exam, uh, I do have uh, an important session regarding uh, the differences between uh, kinetic and static perimetry, and also the details regarding this uh, are mentioned uh, in this course. Actually, if you do have any questions regarding this, uh, feel free to ask me, but this is not that important here. The most important issue is uh, how can we um, read uh, this? A visual field report like that. Uh, the first part or the first thing that I can uh, that I can read is this one, which is very important for reliability indices. Look at this. You do have here uh, fixation losses, false positives and false negatives, and also the tested duration. But here, these three are extremely important. Actually, this fixation losses is not present in uh, in uh, 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 octopus, because if the patient is not fixating, the, uh, the instrument or the device will stop. The test will stop, actually. Um, regarding fixation loss means that the patient is seeing uh, light or seeing stimulus in the blind spot. Uh, this means that the patient is not fixating at all. Uh, if the fixation loss is uh, uh, higher than 25% in the uh, short or CETA uh, program, this means that the uh, test is not reliable. Regarding the false positives, if, if it is uh, um, more than 15%, uh, this means that the, the test is not reliable. And uh, false positives can be, um, or, or the test can record false positive if, the, uh, if there is just a sound and uh, there is no stimulus and the patient is pressing. The patient is telling that he is seeing. Actually, there is no stimulus at all. So this is called, um, uh, false positive, and this is uh, called in another in other words uh, like uh, um, happy trigger syndrome, something like that. Also, in false negatives, here this means that the patient previously uh, saw um, a stimulus with very low light intensity or uh, low light intensity, and the higher light intensity at the same location, the patient didn't record anything, or the patient. Uh, didn't press, the patient tells us that he didn't see uh, this one. And this is called false negative because uh, if the patient sees uh, in uh, a low stimulus or in a low uh, intensity, uh, this uh, necessarily means that if I increase the intensity, the patient uh, must necessarily see. So this is called false negatives. And these false negatives and also the fluctuation uh, will be very high in patients with advanced glaucoma. So uh, we do have 25% after which the test is not that reliable and have to be repeated or has to be repeated. But actually in cases of advanced glaucoma, you may be, uh, or you may have uh, more than 25% of the test and still the study may be 
uh, somehow reliable. Uh, this is regarding the reliability indices. You do here uh, see the Greek skill. Actually, the Greek skill is important for the patient, not for the doctor. Actually, I, I don't uh, rely on this, but this is important for the patient in order to um, in order to give him a clue and a hint about the progression of his disease and in order to understand his disease. Look at this. This is called what? This is called the threshold, actually. And uh, this threshold uh, is uh, measured in decibels, which is directly related to the retinal sensitivity. So if you do have here high decibels in the central region, this means that the central region is very high. Okay? Um, you know, unlike the peripheral parts, which has lower sensitivity. Uh, actually, we don't have normal values, but we do have normal values or mean values in relation to the age or age-related mean values, actually. Um, so uh, um, uh, that's why we do have something called total deviation. I want to show you this. Yes, this one, total deviation uh, or, or the deviation from or the pattern deviation. Sorry, uh, the, sorry the um, standard deviation, which is deviation from the mean values uh, of the same age group. Look at this. If you do see a deviation, which is uh, uh, evident in, in every location or in every part or in each part, this is not that logic. Actually, the visual field defect may, or, or uh, uh, in, in all of cases or in most of cases, either in neurophthalmic diseases or in glaucoma diseases may have a pattern. In order to obtain this pattern, you have to correct for uh, this deviation or this total deviation from uh, the normal values. Because in some cases of cataract or in some cases of corneal edema, these media opacities will affect um, or will result in deviation from uh, normal uh, without the demonstration of the pattern. So I have to correct for this in order to obtain the pattern deviation. Look at this compared between numbers here and here. You will find that uh, all of these parts are considered normal. You will find that the division is zero or one or minus one or minus three or minus two, which are very minimal values. But look at this part, look at this part. Here you do see the division, which is higher. That's why you do have here the division in this part, which is uh, which may be called like r -cotsphotoma. This is the difference between this one, number one and number two. So here we, we rely more on the pattern division, not on the total division. Um, the interpretation of this uh, in statistics will be this one, which is the, the probability plots or the probability uh, values. Here, uh, uh, if you do have p-value, which is below 0.5%, uh, this means that the uh, possibility of having a visual field defect uh, in these parts uh, is very likely. So if you increase the depth or uh, the depth of the pigment actually, or the, um, the, the blackness or the darkness of these uh, areas or dots, this means that you have more susceptibility or more reliability of uh, having a visual field effect or the, the possibility of having a visual field effect in, in, in these locations um, is very high. Okay. Uh, this is uh, briefly how can we read actually there are greater details and we will talk about uh, this uh, more uh, uh, more and more uh, in uh, the section of glucon this was regarding the first uh, uh, session i hope that i have covered all of um, uh, all of uh, uh, the questions regarding how can we will or how we can cover the whole curriculum in uh, relation to uh, people or, or uh, uh, regarding people or candidates who are sitting for um, uh, the clinical ISO exam or clinical FRCS exam or uh, uh, fellowship of European board exam. Uh, also, um, this was a sample of how can we will cover uh, all the topics, uh, samples of my PowerPoint and also my notes and everything. If you do have any questions, just feel free. I, I uh, also want to uh, uh, want to thank you for the trust that you put in me and also uh, uh, all the questions that you ask uh, in uh, either in the Telegram or the WhatsApp group. Uh, 
uh, are extremely welcomed. Thank you all.